what do you see in in the future for for Bitcoin and nuclear energy? I see them making perfect synergistic relationship with each other because one of the biggest liabilities that nuclear power plants have is that when they're operational, they like to operate at full capacity to maximize efficiency and economics. So when there isn't sufficient demand from the local grid to take all that, you end up with having to curtail it or negatively price it, which is a liability on owners of these assets. So to have a technology like free coin mining that can just act as that placeholder, whether they, they can serve many different rules. Now we have available a technology that can just fill in that space perfectly. Welcome back to the Freedom Footprint Show, a Bitcoin philosophy show with Knut Svanholm and me, Luke the Pseudofin. Today, we dig into the fusion of nuclear energy and Bitcoin mining with Ryan McLeod. You might know him as Nuclear Bitcoiner on Twitter. Ryan is a pleb on a mission to revolutionize the concept of small modular reactor Bitcoin mining with over a decade of experience in the industry. In this episode, we explore the future of nuclear power, we discuss why nuclear energy gets so much opposition, and we ponder the exciting possibilities that lie at the intersection of Bitcoin and nuclear. But before we jump in, a quick reminder that the best way to support the show is to send us a boost or stream us some sats using a value for value podcasting app such as Fountain. If you're listening to the show as a podcast, check it out on Fountain. You can earn sats from listening and you can support us in all your other favorite shows. You can also support us on Geyser Fund or send sats directly to our lightning address, freedom at getalby.com. And if you want to exchange your dirty fiat, you can support us on Patreon. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like the episode and subscribe to the channel. Even if you're listening as a podcast, head over to our YouTube channel and subscribe to us there. It would be a big help. And finally, we want to thank today's sponsors, Wasabi Wallet, Orange Pill app, and BitcoinBook.shop. All their information is in the description, and we'll be talking a bit more about them later. And now, without further ado, here is Ryan McLeod on The Freedom Footprint Show. Ryan, welcome to The Freedom Footprint Show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Luke. It's great to be here. Yeah, good to see you, Ryan. Uh, you're known as Nuclear Bitcoin on Twitter, I believe. Yeah, since uh, May 2021, when I jumped into the fray after noticing that uh, talking about mining Bitcoin with nuclear power was kind of an underserved niche that needed somebody in there cheerleading for the idea. And now here I am, traveled the world and talking all kinds of cool Bitcoiners. It's pretty fun adventure. Excellent. To start this off, um, tell us a little about yourself and your how you discover Bitcoin and so on and what what. What made it tick for you? Yeah, Bitcoin. I had already been primed to understand Bitcoin way back in the global financial crisis. I was paying attention to things like Edward Griffin on the you know, Jekyll Island and Ron Paul and the, and the Fed movements and all that stuff. And every once in a while, like Max Kaiser would come up in the content that I was consuming at the time. So I was occasionally getting exposed to little little snippets here of, of the uh, the original prophesizers of Bitcoin going all the way to Max himself. And then I just stopped paying attention with it. Life goes on. I've got a family. I've got work. Then uh, I had cashed out a small amount of Bitcoin, like a few hundred dollars on like, oh, Chris, so 2017, 2018, and just didn't really, still didn't really think much of it. I just had it in a wallet, forgot about it. And then when it was the January 21, like run up from like, was it like 10,000 to 40,000 really quickly? Then I started to take it seriously and consume content. I went straight back into uh, Orangeville podcast because Max was my first familiar touch point. And then before I knew it, it was safety, breed love, uh, BTC sessions, John Ballas, like, yeah, running the whole gambit of all the different podcasts and consuming as much as I can. Well, before I knew it, I was on Twitter and and myself, I have been working in the nuclear industry for the last 10 years or so. Like nothing too special like a nuclear engineer or anything academic. I'm just a, a lab tech that uh, does chemical uh, analysis for various uh, safety and research projects that happen at the Canadian nuclear laboratories. But being where I am, I get a pretty good perspective of how the nuclear industry has been progressing and advancing all years with developments in small modular reactors and advanced reactors, different sizes and types to fit more applications. And it was around the time when Elon Musk began complaining about nuclear power, or Bitcoin's energy usage, that 
my wife just offhanded me suggested like we're going to be building asset Mars and lots of nuclear power and why don't we direct that towards Bitcoin mining and that would pretty much shut down that line of flood entirely if we can get a dominant share of hash rate being mined with nuclear power. And then she made that comment offhandedly, but I had been so immersed in listening to guys like Steve Barber and Adam O from Upstream Data and what they're doing with the flared gas and all the different creative ways coin lighting is being used on uh, energy grids to basically absorb excess generation or waste power in various locations. And I just was enraptured by the idea. It's basically consumed a substantial amount of my thought and bandwidth of the last two years. And then with, along with my wife and two others, we entered this contest that was being hosted by the nuclear power industry. It's so that North, North American young generation that was hosting this contest. They wanted ideas to how to help nuclear power support the UN's 21 sustainable development goals. And regardless of how people feel about this 21 goals on their face value, they are good and reasonable goals. It's how they go about achieving them is where people start to ask questions and raise concerns. But voted the idea and then we won and it gave us the opportunity to go and speak on the idea at a conference in Japan and promote this idea amongst the industry. And it seems at least in the younger generation that's very enthusiastic about their power right now, they were very, very receptive to the idea to the point where at one of these conferences, they actually had the chief nuclear officer from the Susquehanna nuclear power plant, which is where the Talon Energy and uh, Terra Wolf project is happening, where they built the first five meter Bitcoin mining operation. So that was really cool to see that as a, like a formal presentation at a nuclear conference. So they are paying attention to what's going on in the Bitcoin space and they are figuring out ways that they can apply it to the technology as it exists now and as it's going to exist in the not too distant future when we start having a lot wider range of nuclear reactor sizes that can be applied to different markets where traditional large reactors aren't really appropriate in sense. It's a pretty big idea that's been taken off, getting a lot more attention in the last 12 to 18 months. And I'm here for the ride and enjoying it and enjoying talking with people like yourselves. And yeah, it's been a great adventure. Excellent. So, um. What if I just tell you what I know about nuclear power uh, uh, plants and nuclear energy, and you can fill in fill in the blanks and correct me where I'm wrong? So I've sounds heard, like a great place to start. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, but we did some calculations back when I was in, um, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? What's the American equivalent of not high school, but. Uh, what, what would you call it, Luke? What would you call a, a gymnasium in? Uh, is it what's it's high school. Yeah. It's, it's sort of a high, high school yeah. and, and also a university. I studied electro, electric en engineering for one year, but I dropped out. But we did some calculations and like the thing is that nuclear is way, way, way more efficient than any other energy source. Uh, I heard that uh, uh, a, a liter of plutonium contains about as much energy as uh, 5,000 barrels of oil. Well, uh, how's here? This is a fuel pellet and that's roughly one, an average American's yearly usage of electricity represented as an uranium yeah. fuel, fuel pellet. So it's yeah. like, yeah, incredibly dense power. Yeah. So, so the, the real issue is, uh, storage of the waste, which is radioactive for, for, uh, you know, millennia to come. And that's where the moral crux of the problem lies. But from what I know. The reactors, uh, the modern reactors are uh, way, way, way better at uh, uh, recycling um, the waste uh, to, to squeeze out every every last kilowatt out, out of them. And, and that this was more a problem of the past. Uh, and that also in the media, nuclear has been portrayed as a bad thing for many reasons. First of all, that it's confused with nuclear weapons, which is a completely different thing. And also like uh, accidents like uh, Chernobyl, uh, uh, Hiroshima, uh, no, not Hiroshima, that was the atomic bomb, but uh, uh, Three Mile Island and all, all of these. Chernobyl uh, and Fukushima. Yeah, Fukushima, I mean. Uh, so, uh, but, but those reactors were air-cooled instead of water-cooled, or at least Chernobyl was. 
Uh, and that was the big issue. They couldn't contain it and blah, blah, blah. There's a great documentary about it, by the way. Um, so the, the, the way I see it is like, from what I know, you need to build quite a big nuclear power plant for it to make economic sense or, um, and you need it to, to run for 50 years. So for the longest time, I viewed that as very sustainable because from a physics point of view, it is very sustainable because it's, it's obvious you just start the thing up and then it can run by itself for 50 years. The thing is, well, well, I've changed my opinion slightly because it's not praxeologically sustainable or politically sustainable because some, some idiot Green Party or something will always, some, idiot will be voted into office during those 50 years and turn the reactor down, which is a, a bad decision by default almost. And like, uh, so the, sociologically, it, it might not be sustainable for 50 years because the likelihood of some political mis, mismanagement will, to fuck the thing up might, might not be good. So that's, that's, so, so I kind of suspect that the future of nuclear is the, these, uh, mini reactors and these uh, tinier power plants and privately owned and and almost run in someone's basement which sounds dangerous but like wh what do you see there wh what's the future of nuclear what what can you tell me yeah from what i understand the direction that things are headed with the small modular reactors is microgrids so at, at local facilities will have their own self-sustained grids that they'll be able to either connect with other grids and to sell their power or receive other power if they need excess. But it's going to be more distributed and managed at a local level to make sure that every bit, there aren't single points of failure. Like if we did lose a disconnection from one of the large nuclear power plants, then that could disrupt an entire grid that has millions and millions of people on it. So there's there's different trade-offs that you take when you're dealing with smaller grids or larger, like base load reactors. Um, and like, yeah, as for going through the, the list of concerns, like the waste and the duration of the waste is an interesting uh, problem because it technically solves itself because of the way that radioactive material decays over time. Like you'll actually like this. Like, I don't know how familiar you are with calf lives and whatnot, but it's, it's basically I, similar to Bitcoin's half life. It's very similar. It's just like, uh, they have a halving period and it radiates half the amount. Uh, if you have a halving period of eight years, so it, it radiates half of that the next, yeah, all the following eight years. Of, so, yeah. And then half of the material decays into whatever is comes next on the, uh, the decay chain, which to me, yeah. it'll be more stable yeah. elements yes. over time. And then that's how. And so over time, the most dangerous nucleides, they are often the ones that will burn off and decay the fastest and they'll be left yeah. in a less, less hazardous uh, state after a sufficient duration of time. Yeah. And this is how the coal 14 uh, method works for, for, uh, for pinpointing the age of uh, dinosaur fossils and stuff like that. Right. Because you can, you can see how much the coal 14 molecule, molecules have decayed. Or coal, yes. coal fourteen at atoms have decayed, which is a yes. uh, an isotope of coal. That's one of many yeah. different ways that yeah, nuclear radiation is, is used. Like yeah, because it in yeah. dating, and then it's also used in a bunch of medical procedures. Like we create the isotopes by exposing them to nuclear radiation, and we can make isotopes that are used for uh, medical imaging and sterilization and various uh, uh, agricultural. Like, and soil uh, erosion tracing. So there's all kinds of different uses that we're finding for materials that would have otherwise been waste products from the nuclear uh, decay process. But then the other thing that you mentioned is recycling waste in fast reactors will also take that stockpile of nuclear byproducts and reduce them further into even more stable byproducts that by the end of it, the footprint of, of high level radiological material is significantly less and most of the material is still solid, but it's in stable, less, um, less radiological emissions type of material. So there was, those become just safer over time, depending on, yeah, you can either leave them or you can process them through your reactor and do it much faster. Right? And even some, some of these fast reactors, because the way that the fuel decay chain work, they actually breed more fuel while they are reacting 
waste of iron products from the other reactors. They will, they will turn like uh, U U two thirty eight gets uh, decays and it, it it interacts with the neutron and becomes U two thirty nine, and then that is a new fission process mm -hmm. for a molecule that can then engage in the fission process similar to how U two thirty five does. So it, it creates its own fuel as it's reacting. It, it's faster reactors, and so it's mostly a matter of telling the story better because from what I understand, like the and the people opposed to nuclear power have been telling the story and has framing the narrative much more effectively than people promoting nuclear power for the last many decades. But it does seem that that is really starting to shift. And there's a very vocal and enthusiastic pro nuclear movement happening now. It's being yeah. led by like a doctor from Toronto, a, a model from Brazil, a, a former extinction rebellion activist in France. Mm -hmm. And there's some of the most vocal pro nuclear voices out there in space today, getting victories and saving plants from shutting down. It's, it's, uh, it's very refreshing to see where coming in the opposite direction that it had been many recent years. Yeah, I, I know the, uh, there's a tragic story here in Sweden about they, they, they recently shut down two reactors, which the, the way I see it, all the clever environmentalists are pro nuclear. That's that's uh, they they all realize that that's the way forward if if we are to reduce emissions and so so on and so forth. But the uh, new to, let me, and let me ju just jump in here real quick with uh, with uh, go on the the other side uh, of Ostrobotnia here of Botnia Bay and uh, and uh, in 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 Finland I get to be a little smug here that that we've just put yeah. on Okiloto three reactor and. Oh, yeah. Power is negative on some days because the the country is so nuclear. So I mean, it's it's really just a case of you get this jurisdictional, uh, you, you know, when you you just it's well, I guess it's an arbitrage definitely because you just get jurisdictions that embrace yes. it, and but they the, might have had massive cost overruns this particular project. Uh, but now that it's up and running, everyone is thrilled about it and hoping that there's going to be more nuclear here in Finland. So yeah, yeah. and and then three years. Uh, Three generations ahead, uh, uh, some some political uh, shenanigans will go on, and you will suffer the same fate as Sweden. But because what what happened in Sweden was like the last government was a left wing government that won by one seat in the parliament, and they needed the help of the Green Party to to get into power, and so they 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 had to give something back to the Green Party, which was higher taxes on nuclear plant owners, basically. So, uh, which made them unprofitable, and they blamed the free market, which was really the not so free market, and uh, they had to shut down two reactors, and now they're burning coal uh, instead. Uh, like that's gonna, you know, reduce the carbon fr footprint or whatever. And so, so it's kind of tragic, and this is what I mean by the political risk. Uh, by the way, are are you familiar with the concept of element Bitcoin being element zero? Yeah, I have read uh, the your bulgy books. I got them right here. Excellent. <laughs> After I got the yeah, seventeen yeah. independence. Everything fired by twenty one million. Very Beautiful. much enjoyed them. Yeah, Thank I like the, the chapter on alchemy. So, and how that like frames it. Yeah, it says yeah, yeah. Trying to create so, an element for its properties, not for its just Aaron's yeah. being. Yeah, very interesting concept. Uh, a thing I left out from that chapter, which is interesting, is that you could view the altcoins and the the Bitcoin forks as radioactive isotopes, unstable isotopes of of uh, element zero. So they decay over time and release uh, uh, toxic uh, copium uh, <laughs> that that, that uh, you know. It, what's the opposite of enrich and poor? <laughs> That and poor their owners. Anyway, uh, this is a, a stupid tangent, yeah. but we should go on with the. Uh, so, what's what's what do you see in in the future for for Bitcoin and uh, nuclear energy? What's what, what's the connection and what's the big big thing happening in the future? I see them making perfect like synergistic relationship with each other because like. Like we could mention, one of the biggest liabilities that nuclear power plants have is that when they're operational, they like to operate at full capacity to maximize efficiency and economics. So when there isn't sufficient demand from the local grids to take all that, you end up with having to curtail it or negatively price it, which is a liability on 
owners of these assets. So to have a technology like tree coin mining that can just act as that placeholder, whether they, it can serve many different rules, it could just be a large static load, it could be a large flexible load, it could just be a small load that, that just sits at that margin between the supply and demand, because no matter how much we want to engineer society, human demand for electricity is going to fluctuate, whether it's in mornings, afternoons, at night, uh, seasonally, whether it's summer or winter, and whether you live in different climates, you're never going to have perfect alignment. If, you, if you're just generating a stable baseload of electricity, it's never going to align perfectly with a stable baseload of demand. But now we have available a technology that can just fill in that space perfectly scaled to meet where any generation profile anywhere that is, whether it's on grid, whether it's off grid, it's like one of the um, game plans that we have for in Canada is we want to build and design and mass produce the five megawatt reactor design, which is a really tiny unit that can transport it on it in a single shipping container. And they want to send those to all kinds of northern communities throughout Canada and upgrade all of them off in diesel and get them onto nuclear and use it that more efficiently. And it'll in these communities where unsubsidized, their electricity costs are routinely easily like a dollar a kilowatt hour, which is outrageously high. So we can even, by upgrading them to nuclear, bring that down to like 20, 20, 30 cents. That's a huge chain and less money will be needed to subsidize just cost of living as these they can go towards more community development. And then on the other side, where the Bitcoin money comes in, is it, if we're deploying remotely, like you might have a community that only needs seven megawatts. Now the future is projected that they want to grow into like up to 20, 25 megawatts. You can build the capacity immediately while using the miners as a placeholder, as the community grows into itself because of modularity of miners, they can either easily be redeployed somewhere else. Cause now we're seeing like robust marketplaces for, for ASICs, for hash rate. You can do all kinds of other like hedging uh, uh, strategies like that, or because the reactors themselves are modular, can just add more generation capacity if the situation calls for it and want to continue mining at the same capacity where it gives more optionality to the way that these grids can be configured. Like right now, they're talking about like they want to use technology like hydrogen production, deceleration as like, this kind of anchor. Um, industrial technologies that will be able to support the development of a lot of these nuclear power plants. One of, one of the large projects that's undergoing right it's currently under in the licensing process is at El Doom port in New Brunswick. They have a large port that's got about a gigawatt of coal operating at right now. And it's a large industrial facility that does a lot of that export operations, but they want to completely gut all of the coal out of that or basically nuclear power as a 100 megawatt modules of a it's the arc stall. Yeah, well, arc molten salt reactors. That's one of the reactor types that can be fueled by um, recycled fuel from traditional oil water reactor states. And then they want to turn that facility into a large clean energy um, in innovation and infrastructure park that then they'll be able to export uh, hydrogen and higher order chemicals that they're able to produce with this vast amount of power. They'll be able to do all kinds of uh, desalination, mass producing the reactor at that site. So they'll be able to export it right from New Brunswick to and many other jurisdictions that are able to support this type of reactor, which hopefully once we've got these SMRs licensed and standardized, the licensing process in countries that don't have traditional nuclear industries will have more of a fast track to get that their licensing and regulatory infrastructure set up and configured along the lines of the no product that has been quality tested in numerous other jurisdictions that already have demonstrated robust regulatory and compliance licensing services. So it's, it's got a lot of big moving parts because there's 70 different reactors that are by four be first to the market. And some of them, some of them will definitely overlap with market share. Then others will, will be in unique markets like these very tiny reactors, which have to build a lot of them to justify like, units of scale. And so they do it as units of, of multiples and as the scale drives down the marginal cost of production of each individual unit. So it requires advanced commitments from a lot of parties to be like, yes, we want this technology to commit to buying a lot of it. So we have a few 
chicken and egg shell drones, but like they, they have to get licensed and they also have commitments for purchasers and the confidence that the investors are going to be able to get a return on their investment by having sufficient demand for the power that's getting generated from this reactor. So that is basically the next five to seven years of the nuclear industry. It's, it's getting all of this tied up so that then once we've got some of these reactors demonstrated at the first kind, which is going to be an expensive, cumbersome process of licensing yeah. and engineering, then we get past the gradually phase and finally reach the suddenly part where we can start deploying these reactors in a massive scale to different jurisdictions and communities that are going to be served by them. So, so one of the one of the risks involved with these mini reactors are they are, are they dangerous? Uh, is is there fun to be debunked there, or like what? What's the risk of a uh, of a meltdown uh, on one of these small reactors? They, I can't. You can't say with these with any certainty that it's not zero, but it's pretty damn close to zero that it's there possible because they they've been designed with like inherent safety configuration so that yes. if the reactor core loses cooling because of the, the cooling techniques they use, they will be able to just passively reduce their temperature without having to uh, and requiring external support from like water or electricity to keep them no cool. They will be able to automatically fail into a safe state where even that without operator pitch So it'll it takes a lot of the potential operator error out of because the reactors are designed to automatically like scram themselves into a state where they can point into a jet on operation safely if if there is an incident that would require them to do so. Nice. Uh, did you see the Chernobyl documentary, by the way? Or it's not a documentary; it's a it's a, drama. a a drama, a four episode drama. Uh, no, I haven't actually seen that one. See, I have any H two. All right. Sure. Just as luckily, like I've heard about it, and like I know I'm familiar enough with the event from like people that I work with. Like yeah. They were working in the industry when that happens. So they've got all kinds of uh, historical context that I've been provided with with this. It was just it was a poor reactor design. It was poorly managed, and it was a poor timing to do a high risk test. And things things went sideways. Yeah, and and, uh, yeah. and you you see uh, clearly in that uh, in that series uh, that the uh, the underlying political system is the core of the problem because uh, everyone's lying about their achievements all the time and like uh, nobody wa- everyone wants to be a yes man politically uh, and nobody wants to give anyone higher up any bad news because they're scared of being punished uh, so it's 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 just. Yeah, very depressing. Uh, but it also points out, like, very clearly, if you read between the lines, that the politics is really the problem. That that's why things like these, like this, fail. And it's it's not the technology itself that fails. It's 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 the human tendency to to politicize everything that fucks it up uh, in the end. Yeah, don't we see it? Like we're all obsessed with the money, or the they interfere with the mining it seems that all the entire culture around it just seems to slowly degrade unexpected ways nobody would have predicted even when yeah like people that did see that this was a potential future that we were heading for when we broke the gold standard like yeah some of the things going on today were definitely even just a few years ago not uh not even expected but it, i guess that's you can expect them like when everything's deteriorating at two, three percent a year, like it does start to reach that point where that exponential starts to become very visible to either people that weren't paying attention to it. And yeah, it's like clown world is just accelerating at an exponential rate. Just when you think that you can't be surprised by it anymore, something weird and crazy happens to get us uh, yeah, off the rail again. Now they're getting the chance to try to pay edge to aliens again. Like all my life, I was like, yeah, I want to believe. I was very much of that illness. Like there's, there's mm-hmm. something there. But now, now that they're openly being like, yes, there's aliens. I'm just like, no. I don't, I don't believe you. I can't believe anything. Like I've been put into the state where it is hard to believe anything that I'm being told 
about anything like authoritative states because everybody's got an agenda. Everyone's trying to sell yeah. a narrative. I it's like, so we're only way to counter it is just tell our own stories and tell them better. Or else. Is inflation a, the, the, the equation, the equivalent of radioactive decay, but for money? Sort of is like it could, and has a half life of four years, but it's for the, the political play. Yeah. Well, because that's, that's how the half lives are calculated. It's it's yeah, inferred yeah. from from how many decays per second yeah. are coming off this material, and then calculate definite, how long it lasts. And yeah, we do the same thing with with money. Right? There's definitely a parallel there, anyway. And and I like it's these cascading effects. I mean, I I at the end of the day. Fiat currency is to blame for what happened in Sweden, where where they shut down the reactors. Also, because like it, when you when you see it, when when you see inflation for what it is, it, what it does, it it funnels wealth from the people to the politically connected, like and the political class. So be, so because governments can spend more when they when they can hide the costs from the general public, which is basically what the inflation is. It's a hidden tax. So, which means that people will vote more and more for more and more political control because they think that's the only alternative because they don't see the cost, they, they don't see what they're, what they're paying. Uh, they don't get the correct bill for the whole ordeal. And I, I think that plays in a lot to, to why it's so mismanaged and why there's like clown world things because a nuclear reactor in, in, in the hands of, uh, um, Clown world people is a very scary thought, isn't it? It can be, but like, luckily, most of the people that operate these nuclear reactors are, are engineers and they are capable of keeping them operational. But it does, well, yeah, when, when the material and supply lines that they require to keep them operational continue to degrade because of things like inversion and where we see just, yeah, shrink plate, like we're, everything, packages are getting smaller, quality goes down or it gets more expensive. Those like, three prongs that we just see across the board. People don't seem to understand that, especially in technologies where they have a, like long supply chains and that is being added on every single point, whether it's the electricity at the raw materials at the first fabrication step, all of these higher order and capital materials are being built into larger capital projects like building a nuclear reactor. Like every little, little piece of that puzzle gets, gets just that little little piece shaven off of for the rent seekers. And I do see it like a lot as well with the way that uh, there's the fights over subsidies. Like I wouldn't be surprised if the Greens in Sweden are celebrating the shutdown of the nuclear power plants because now they can use that to justify lobbying for more financing for wind and solar panels, which exactly. are just like, I, I argue that like those are the shit points of the energy sector because they're just the parasites. They, on, on their surface, when they're built and they're operating and see them generating electricity, like that, that's cool. And that's great that you're getting free electricity from nature. But what seems to always be ignored is everything else before and after that why those facilities are operational. Like there's very little acknowledgement of the trade-offs to go into, like where this material is dispositioned from, where the event is manufactured and, and because we'd see all the, the different uh, right, labor markets and it's the materials for building solar panels comes from, and it's not a pretty picture when put it all together. And so it's, it's hard, and it's also hard to see that if they claim that they want to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere, their actions are resulting in very much opposite outcomes of what their stated goals are. So it very makes it hard to take them seriously. Craft this doom and gloom narrative where the apocalypse is on us. That we do not implement their very narrow, very questionable strategy immediately. We're all going to be duped. And if we advocate particular power, we're not going to, it's going to take too long and it's going to cost too much. Or we advocate for just making ourselves more resilient by just doubling down on like hydrocarbons because they work to make us more resilient to nature's conditions, they, that is also right in a front to belief system that they've crafted around, but carbon is this death molecule that we need 
protect the entire world from, but it's, it's an essential element. It's part of our world that has been around as long as planet has. Like, I, I think it's going to be fine. Like, I don't know. Maybe they're more worried about the way that George Carlin thinks it. It's just like, the planet's going to be fine. But we're fucked. Shit goes sideways. So that's yeah. why I want to see nuclear power and, and resilient infrastructure so that we take whatever Mother Nature throws at us and we can just weather it and move on and be more resilient to learn from it to develop even more robust strategies to keep humanity proliferating into the future. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, right now we're in this weird spot where everyone seems to be just fighting over the money I've had every level. It's just give me power so that I can spend my in for my chosen projects. Yeah. See how that goes through the street. It's it's tragic. Like I I'm the first to admit that I haven't done the research myself on climate change. I haven't seen the figures or done any calculations myself. I can only, you know, take at face value what the TV and what various internet sources tells me about it. So I don't know to which extent humanity is uh, the cause of the problem. And I don't know the extent of the, of the problem itself. But what I do know from deductive reasoning alone is that hiring a politician to solve the problem is uh, akin to hiring an arsonist uh, as the CEO of the fire brigade, because they are the ones that are most likely to fuck it up. I mean, uh, I, I, I can also deductively reason myself to that the, the core of any environmental problem stems from overconsumption and misallocation of resources. And there's no thing in the world that is as good as misallocating resources and make people into consumerist sheep as inflationary currency. That's that's the core problem. That fix that, and you fix the money, fix the world. It's it's absolutely true, in my opinion. That's well, uh, the fiat science chapter in Safe Spot, Fiat Standard. Just to go yeah. on how it just yeah. it, it it pollutes it by just the the money. He who holds the money dictates what gets research. So if you want to get research grants, you have to be doing the the hot and flashy stuff that money managers want to see and fear sells and apocalypse narratives sell. So then you, you see more of that because that's what gets financed and that's gets to journals. And then the uh, opposing views end up getting marginalized. You only end up beginning exposed to them on like what appear to be like shady internet sites that are like, but we've gotten to that point where the, the discussion of valid topics has become so bifurcated that like, yeah, you need to seek out such a vast number of sources to make sense of anything that's going on. Yeah. To, to try to outright trust the media narrative that's not uh, led us to a good place. Like, and you can't just automatically assume the opposite because then that puts you to an even weirder, darker place. Like I, I hang out with a lot of like the, the, the freedom normie types that were, they were very they, they were very energized when the you know, convoy happened in Canada. It's very enthusiastic movement, a lot of, a lot of energy, a lot of Canadians coming together across all walks. Like a very weird collective moment for Canada. Pieces. Like we had all been locked down for a long, long time. And then it just started with one trucker just basically saying, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Started driving his truck and many other truckers and those like minded individuals started driving with them. And they all just pulled up on Trudeau's torch or porch to uh, hang out and uh, have a party. And essentially, they humiliated the guy to the point where, to save face, he had to put it down by force instead of actually engaging with the protesters as to why they were there and what their goals and ambitions were. It all just got framed in the media as like they're they're just they're all right. They're, they're funded by Russians. Yeah. They're funded by Trump supporters. Just every sphere that they throw out of it has since now been disproving quite easily. And all it took was like one swastika showing up for a few minutes on the first day to just taint the entire uh, event as, well, didn't you see that swastika? You know, Ottawa, that's, that's what that represents. So it was, it was a really weird moment because like we all knew that, that guy had nothing to do with what was there. Or it was being displayed ironically because there was actually a few of those that were just like, Trudeau is the one that's promoting like these ideas. So it's, it's very tricky in these environments to, to navigate these, uh, yeah, these complex values that people want. 
Yeah. The thing, actual na- Nazis are pretty ra- rare. Uh, <laughs> they, they, uh, the, their numbers are vastly exaggerated by the media. And like w- what I always say is like, if you don't want to be a, a, a Nazi, don't be a national socialist, don't be a nationalist and don't be a socialist. And then you avoid the problem. That's the, that's like the, that's what, what they were. They were natural socialists. So don't be a nationalist and don't be a socialist and you're fine. You're not a Nazi. Today's show is brought to you by our sponsors. First up, Orange Pill app. Stack friends who stack sats, meet like-minded Bitcoiners near you and help speed up hyper-Bitcoinization with Orange Pill app. Bitcoin isn't an online-only phenomenon and Orange Pill app helps facilitate the social layer, connecting Bitcoiners in their local area. It maintains your privacy through the whole process and since you have to pay to access the app, you know that everyone there cares about Bitcoin and is high signal. A great new feature is events. You can create events and meetups right from the Orange Pill app and help build your local community while maintaining the Bitcoin only signal. Orange Pill app is available on iOS and Android. Download now. Next up, Wasabi Wallet, an open source, non custodial desktop wallet that is trustless, easy to use, and affordable. It has CoinJoin built in to facilitate your privacy. Every Bitcoin transaction leaves a clear footprint, but with Wasabi, you can make sure that others can't track your steps and threaten your sovereignty. Just send your coins to Wasabi Wallet, wait, and your coins will be private on the other end. It's open source, trustless by design, and non-custodial. You have full control over your keys. Check it out now at wasabiwallet.io. Uh, by the way, I... I learned a new word today from Hodlot. Uh, it's a complicity theorist, and it's sort of the opposite of a conspiracy theorist. Uh, so complicity theorist, noun, is a word that describes a person who accepts the political narrative of the day unquestionably, consumes mainstream media like it was 1980, and is prone to submissiveness, outbursts of irrational fear, and public shaming of free thinkers. Well, the... Um, uh, the way the way I see that word is that you know most of the conspiracies, the conspiracy theories are are probably wrong, but at least they're better than complicity theory. Com- <laughs> complicity, compl- what what's the word? Com- complicity, complicity, <laughs> compliance. It, it certainly fits the the narratives of the day. Like it's, it's, it's the NPC meet where it's just, uh, yeah, you're just consistent yeah. with whatever, whatever is the current thing of the day and don't question what else is going on. Just steer, yeah, steer your life right into the 15 minute city. It's apparently a conspiracy, but they're you've quite openly expressing that, yeah, we're going to be in very narrow traveling zones. No. Without, yeah. You're going to have a score on how much you're consuming. Yeah, like I'm, I'm aiming for the opposite. Like we're going to, going to supercharge new bit power with Bitcoin, and that Bitcoin is going to Trojan horse all of these institutions. Because, like, when you think about, like, as much as like us Bitcoiners were kind of like is the on like the whole big invest firms getting into Bitcoin, but if they start to clue into the to like the next order consequences, like they want Bitcoin then they can obtain Bitcoin by mining Bitcoin. So if they want to mine Bitcoin, they need power infrastructure. So if these big investors start investing in power infrastructure, then we might be starting to get somewhere. But then yeah. it also starts playing into higher order game theory, like Jason Lowry's thesis, just like if you want your adversaries to be mining less Bitcoin, you have to be mining more Bitcoin. So that it creates yeah. this, this feedback loop where everyone's just devoting more and more power to generating more and more computation and hash rates to just have more and more piece of pie that's shared amongst us all globally. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. When you extrapolate the thoughts, they, they always lead to, to a very optimistic future. Like, because Bitcoin will win. Like, there's no, unless there's some unforeseen black swan event uh, that we can't predict. Like, but if it just keeps on trucking, pun intended, then we win. The, there's like no way because it benefits everyone who adopts it greatly. So, so like the, the game theory is, is already there. Anyway, uh, where are we in the conversation? Luke, do you have any, any questions for, uh, for Ryan? 
Yeah, you know the the thing here. We uh, and first of all, I realized I'd I'd seen you on Valis before, uh, and I know you'd been a couple of of other places as well. But it was the Valis interview that that I watched, and so this immediately brought a couple of uh, other specific connections. I realized, and it's of course come out in the conversation that uh, yeah, we we share uh, you know our our common origin. I'm I'm. Uh, uh, I've I've lead from Canada, so to say, um, but uh, you're still there fighting the good fight, I guess. Um, and then the other thing is, I think there's a couple of things about energy that we could get into. So, so I'm glad you've already touched on some stuff with the uh, truckers and all that. But now I kind of have a question about kind of energy more generally. Like one thing with nuclear that I really find great is that it basically can replace every other type of electricity requirement, but what about cases where oil and gas is still going to be required? Like um, Finland, as an example, doesn't have its own sources of oil and gas. So although it can replace all kinds of electricity generation, it, it's still dependent on importing oil from other places. So is there any role in nuclear in in filling that gap? Or are we always going to kind of need a, a little bit of both? We're always probably going to need some oil and gas at gold for like the very, very high heat applications. But there are some of these new reactor designs that will be able to serve heat applications up to like eight, 900 degree Celsius type of range. So they'll be able to do like concretes, higher, high order, like chemical production. Uh, like they might not be enough to get to like steel, but you can use electricity and high induction to create steel. So there's, there are ways to get around that one. But, but like, they're still going to need like coking furnaces for like very, very high, high grade steels that require very high temperatures. Textiles definitely could be done with uh, nuclear power. Pharmaceuticals could be done. There's many agricultural, uh, like uh, distillery type of scenarios, like a lot of like mid, mid to high grade heat applications can definitely be done by a lot of these reactor designs. So it'll, it'll depend on the market. Like I know Dow chemical is looking at one of these reactor designs will operate about 600 degrees Celsius for its output temperature. But it'll be perfect for making pharmaceuticals and that sort of application. So just about matching the right uh, design to the application. So yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of look right, eyes on like, district heating and various other heat applications. Yes. They're trying to open as many different markets as possible for nuclear power to apply to to make it as you know whole eggs. As wide, yeah, as as many markets as possible that we can get into, so we can sell products that we're trying to sell. And if there is goal in the long term to displace hydrocarbons wherever we can, electricity and heat are the lowest hanging fruit that we can uh, go out for what I see in the, the the ecosystem that is out there these days. So like in some places, it's just a matter of like getting electricity and getting them off of zero in many the, the developed these emerging markets. And some of them, we may be able to skip right up into nuclear from where the grids are right now. Like I know that there are many countries throughout Africa, the Middle East, South America are buying up uh, nuclear power. I know like Uganda just out of nowhere three days ago announced that they want to build 15 gigawatts of nuclear power. They want to collaborate with South Korea to do that. So... So that means that there's a lot of countries paying attention to what just happened in the, the UAE and finishing those, that set of four reactors that they just built. And even them, they have just decided that they're not finished. They're already starting the process on getting another two built. And I did see, I think like winds might be changing in places like, like Sweden. I know South Korea was uh, now like they had a president that was definitely post their power, but now he's ordering their power. So South Korea is a, their power knows. They can provide the technology to many nations that are are seeking it out for the first time. Um, I like to, yeah, the, the Nordic countries, they're doubling down on nuclear power, at least Poland, Estonia, Lithuania. I even had a uh, brief opportunity at adopting Bitcoin last year. I ran into uh, Prince Philip and I was pushing him on that. The, uh, the energy mix of Serbia and I was like, so I'm suggesting they could use nuclear power over there. So I think there's, there's plants in more of the neighboring countries well, they definitely buy a lot of electricity, from, but they don't have explosive their own power just yet. They they still buy a lot of oil, gas, and coal from from yeah, further east. So it's everyone's just trying to find their own come independent, their own ways. Because 
learning recently that becoming dependent on your neighbors, even if like you know, becoming dependent on allies could put these nations into precarious positions. Like, depending on nations you are adversarial towards can put you even more precarious situation where uh, things go sideways. And not to judge sides on like the, the, the Russian Ukraine war, but it was like, it was to say that it wasn't provoked or instigated for many, many years. It's kind of missing a lot of the, the last eight, nine years going on in that part of the world. So it'd be like, it'd be like getting upset at the United States for putting down a civil war happening in Mexico, right on their border. It's, it's a, it's a tough situation and I, everybody, I can't feel for the citizens involved, but like everybody involved in decision making as far as concerned is basically a criminal, the criminals that are prolonging that war and basically giving Ukraine just enough weapons to continue fighting, but not actually do anything meaningful. Any on the Russian side is just destroying what was once a pretty robust nation. Like, and then that's caused so much disruption to the energy security all throughout Europe with the, the Nord Stream pipeline. And now Germany has to buy a lot of its resources on the spot markets. So they're driving up the cost of oil and gas for emerging markets. And it's all of these knock on effects from, from events going on in the world to, to people not fully paying attention, seeing random sporadic, but like, when you start seeing the world through like the view of like money is, is a different framework. Many well, people don't view the world through. You definitely start to see the events make a lot more sense in the way that they play out in order to tolerance. Very, very interesting, fascinating to watch. Yeah. And the, um, the mainstream media uses the, the war to, to explain inflation, which is like, that was, I mean, it plays a part, as you say, that the, the costs go up, but the main problem was inflation. Like in Sweden, they call, started to call the higher fuel costs, Putin prices as soon as the war started, but the prices had gone up the uh, way before that. So, so it's still money printing is the, is the big bad guy here. It's the, it's the one thing that keeps the, 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 that, that, that enables these people in power to, to prolong every war and prolong every bad policy uh, uh, without cost. And that's, that's where the core of all the problems lie. Yeah. And it's so insidious because it's like setting off a fuse on a time bomb that you're not going to have to consequences of. And uh, they have a significant lack of being able to look back at decisions made, policies made to determine where what's happening now might have been affected by decisions made two, three years ago. There's always a current state. There's always somebody that can be found today that can blame on the outcome of decisions that were made years ago. Yeah, that means every time, like you can see, once you start to see it, yeah, you see the cycle just repeating over and over and over again. Yeah. And everything seems dramatic. Like, are, are you familiar? Is it called the like, Harry Kari? It's the, the style of drama that professional wrestling employs, where it's yeah, like it's... everybody, we, we know the audience knows that it's fake and dramatized. Like it's still athletic and it's well, very well choreographed, but it's still funny. Yeah. But. It's the, 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 the drama is what engages the audience and they'll, they'll flip a good guy to a bad guy. It just in short notice, just to play on how the story is, needs to play out. It does feel very similar to how modern politics feels like right this now is, in Canada, we've got like Trudeau was framed as like baby face, pretty, pretty boy and, and just put up there and he looked good and then he got chosen and now it's turning around. Now he's like the heel and, and now Pierre Polyev, like, he seems to positive towards Bitcoin. He's being set up as like the guy that's going to save us from Trudeau, the bad guy. Feel all feels really yeah. slimy and dramatic. Yeah. And, and they say the things you want here, but that makes me even more want to scrutinize them even heavier. The ones yeah. that are telling me what I want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same with the uh, RFK and, and the US. Like, uh, the thing with Bitcoin is that it's not democracy money. It's anarchy money. Like it, 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 if it needed politicians to thrive, we wouldn't need big, like Bitcoin wouldn't work if we needed permission. Permissionless is like less than one. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. Then people don't seem to get that. They seem to like, they still want this stamp of approval from whatever authority. And that's the saddest part. 
certainly not going to get it. Things are changing very fast. People aren't, people aren't ready for it. But then that's one of the concerns that I have too, is like too, too many black pills served out too quickly to have very, uh, severe consequences. People are angry all at the same time. So it needs to be a very controlled process. Like I, I like handing yeah. out the orange pills. It seems like, like people like Trudeau and, uh, Sanford, the guy from uh, the, the guy from the BIS, the guard and all of them, they're, they're the best orange pillars to God out there. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even need For, to explain Bitcoin, just like show a clip of, of them yeah. talking about what they're up to. It's, yeah. Christine Lagarde but done the best, read the best ad for Bitcoin ever when she said, if there is an escape hatch, that escape hatch will be used. Yes, she's right. We will use the escape hatch. I was about to say that I have the same attitude to wind power as the turbine itself. I'm not a big fan. Uh, what else? If I was a leader of the Republican Party in the US, I would use the tagline nuclear family, nuclear power, renewable family and renewable power. Um, sort of surprised that no one has seen that yet. Uh, what else? What, what else do we have uh, for Ryan Luke? Yeah, well, <laughs> Ryan, uh, setting Knut's uh, enjoyable humor aside, um, the, the, uh, I, I think. Enjoyable? That... Is that all I get? Enjoyable? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, it was a compliment. Um, I, I guess the, the thrust of it that, uh, uh, that I think we always like to contextualize here is, is how can, um, I guess, uh, regular Bitcoiners get involved and and be a part of of what you're you're doing and and what's happening with the the nuclear here. Is there is there any kind of um, way to follow this or advocate for it uh, somehow? At the moment, it's mostly just working on working through people's ignorance of the technology. Most people they they've heard about nuclear power. It's it's like nuclear has been dealing with the same shit that Bitcoin deals with just for many decades longer. It's like it's technology that everybody knows exists and is heard of, but it's nobody knows barely anything uh, of it except for what they hear in the mainstream narratives, which is typically negative, like most people's percent of their power is shaped by the citizens. And like I was just caught at Simpsons recently where they wanted to replace the buses with nuclear powered buses. The first thing that you see is just the buses just glowing. It's, it's just a silly representation of how that would change. Like in the real world, like, yeah, we, we make electric buses. They would probably be powered by electricity that was powered by, generated by a nuclear power. That would be more realistic. I don't think we're a long way from nuclear powered buses, but maybe nuclear powered freighters. You saw on the team. I, uh, yeah, it's, there's a lot more advocacy groups popping up here and there promoting nuclear power. Like almost each country has like a stand up for nuclear organization that's, rallying like-minded individuals to support technology and it's mostly like grassroots ragtag people aren't even related to the industry for the most part like some of them are like they'll be brought in as consultants especially like when some of these older guys retire they'll they'll join these pro fair groups and and consult with them on various aspects of their advocacy and if you do have relationships power infrastructure or like well politics just like toss around the idea of SMRs being deployed in your local communities. It's like, you never know who would be receptive to those ideas. Like it's like whole remnant ideas. It's just like, just talk about the idea. Don't like water it down. And you never know who's, who's actually listening. Like I've had some surprising conversations over the last weeks that have put me in a position where I can plant, I can basically plant seeds with individuals like two or three degrees away from myself. It's may or may not bear fruit, but if they do take like five to 10 years to really start showing anything or substance, but when they do, it's going to be quite spectacular. It's just the other the idea, the other day, I had a conversation with someone from UK Bitcoin Policy Institute, and they just wanted to know more about like our, and I did a quick review of like UK and their, their strategies and their goals for how they want to adopt like, their power to every country. And like, they want to build a few new big reactors. And they're also courting five companies that are proposing SMR designs. So I had this silly idea of thinking about an individual that we know in the UK that's trying to build a soccer foot 
football, sorry, gentlemen, football empire. Um, and if his ambitions play out the way that, that, that we all hope they do, he's going to eat a large football stadium and it's going to eat a large power source. So why not start planting the seed now, possibly building a small modular reactor in Bedford power performing football empire? Like, you never know what might come of silly little ideas like this in the coming years. It's, that's, that's a very like book. Yes, you never know who you're gonna who you're gonna talk to quite these seeds with. So I'm just here. Here's an idea. Let's see what happens. Eight bioreactor. <laughs> yeah, he could become the Mister. He'd, he'd be the Mister Burns of Bedford. <laughs> he but then, like, is, isn't he? <laughs> he's getting there. And then, like, like Madeira would be another interesting use case for getting yeah. like small nuclear reactors. Like El Salvador is another good use case. Like I suggest that instead of Instead of building power lines straight from the volcanoes, the geothermal lake they want, use that, mine the Bitcoin in the jungle where it's hard to get that power to people, and then just recycle that into building more power yeah. generation. Local yeah. cities like yeah. SMR, like we can do all kinds of interesting configurations like that. And that's the beauty of these technologies. Both of them are modular, they can scale well, and they can they, they match each other perfectly. We can put them wherever we want. We can. We can play out Brandon Putnam's pioneered species idea, essentially. I'm just put a reactor, Bitcoin miners, buy the seed, see what grows around it. And I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure we're going to have some Bitcoin miners knocking up on the doors of these SMR companies, especially if we get a few bull runs, at least ones that have a lot of Bitcoin on their balance sheets. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if, if guys like Fred Deal from Marathon are already thinking about the idea and planning strategies to, uh, Make that a reality once the reactors are on the market. Because he's already got a relationship in Abu Dhabi, building a facility, a uh, mining facility close to reactors in Dubai. So it's, uh, it's interesting to see how all these pieces move, especially since the Bitcoin miners that survived yeah. this market, they're going to be very in a very good position to capitalize on the next cycle that we go through. They're going to they're going to attract a lot of attention from energy generators that are either going to want to like buy these companies to bring under their own like purview or learn from them to do it themselves. There's going to be a mix of yeah, generators becoming miners, miners, generators, everything in between. It's going to be a very, very exciting future for this space and, and more different strategies that we can see employed. Better we have an idea of what will work and forward in the future, then maybe we can have that future that Tolbert so beautifully eloquently uh, frames out for us in the, uh, the generational wealth video. Yes. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful video. Uh, but yeah, just to rewind back to the politicians fucking everything up, I just recalled something about uh, Sweden's history with nuclear. And uh, I think there's a similar story in all other uh, or in many other Western countries, uh, like right after Chernobyl, uh, there was a ban on on uh, nuclear research, which is just it's so really? ridiculous that you can't you can't research this subject. Uh, and and uh, Sweden was kind of pioneers when the the reactors were built back in the seventies. So so uh, we were at the top of our game there, and then uh, all of a sudden with it. No, no research was allowed anymore, uh, for just for political cos cosmetics and political cheap political points, and uh, so so I think that's uh, that's the beauty of the era we live in now, though, because we have the internet and we have Bitcoin and we can we have these Zoom calls. We can we can talk to one another in in ways we were never able to do before. And uh, I think a ban on research isn't really something that can happen in 2023. Not to, not to the same extent, at least. No, oh, that is silly. And yeah, one thing that like, the nuclear industry can definitely take a lot from, from like Bitcoin mining is to me that research and development is done in such an open source way. Like, and I get that the uh, have like such large capital projects you want to protect your research farm to protect whatever intellectual property that may have been developed through the funding of that research, but to really help technology liberate, we could, it needs more of that sharing of intellectual property so that 
that somebody else can take take an idea that's great, and, and if it's not like, protected by IP, they can they can build upon, iterate upon better. So there there isn't as much of that. It like it's very highly protected. To, uh, it's industries that like really like to protect their their data research. At at the end of the day, there's only one real intellectual property. Where, where do you have the property rights, <laughs> like where they're valid and, you know, <laughs> you can't yeah. argue against them. Yeah, because when it's just an idea and yeah, IT is it's like a virus spread amongst many minds and who knows what, which mind is the right one to take that idea and create it into something even more beneficial than what the original idea was. That's the beauty of like watching stuff proliferate on Austin like that. I heard you talking the other day with someone that, yeah, you haven't gone too, too deep down the Noster rabbit hole yet. But it is interesting watching the ecosystem kind of develop in a yeah. grassroots kind of way where, where it's just like these tinkers in their grass. Like, like the Noster itself is just the protocol. But then all of the clients, you know, how are just different, different strategies and different ways to interact with the protocol to present the data where it really has its advantage over the other social media. It's just, create your identity at the profile level and manage that shared cross clients so that you can have, you can use that same profile for like eBay service or a, or, or Twitter like service for an Instagram. So it's all, and then if you get nuked by one of them, like you don't lose your whole profile, you don't lose all your no. followers. So it's, it's, it's still in its infancy just yet. It's mostly just the Bitcoin takers playing with this. Yeah, it uses familiar technology, but it it's I not a, I'm just uh, you know, I'm questioning the scalability of it all, but I but I love watching it play out now. And like I attended two of those Noster beach parties on Miami Beach during the conference, uh, the Bitcoin conference in Miami, and and you could only get the information that the parties were happening at all by an Noster or someone telling you. But but still, it's it was a very uh, two very cool events all in the dark uh, on Miami Beach. So, yeah, uh, it's a cool community. It is. And sapping is fun, man. And I saw they've got actually got worse to laugh now. So it's like, yeah, yeah. It's it's a pretty cool feature where you can just like, I like what you created. Zap. It is. Why aren't, why aren't saps everywhere? Sooner or later they will be, but why aren't they right now? Well, um, it just seems like all the other forces aligned against it are just we can create our own better thing. Like I mean, I'm still new to yeah. Bitcoin, but it sounds like that's been tried. Just accept the one that works. And now with all this, like the, the L402 with the, the, the uh, yeah, the, the logic gate that requires a cost that they're yeah. starting to, to, yeah, for having like using lightning to make like API calls for AI bots and stuff. So like. This stuff is going to blow up in, in a weird, unexpected way. The, yeah. Not many people, except for like the guys like right at worst, guys swan are going to be ready for what's coming. Like there's going to be new tools available that even, even people paying close attention aren't going to be prepared for. No, it's, it's moving so fast and it's, it's so cool. And so the, the, the thoughts are so novel. Uh, and all because we have a system that doesn't change, uh, at the core. It's just, yeah, it's, it's created this system. Like we're all self-organizing around it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just this yeah. core, this, this idea, just, we like this idea and we're going to rally around it. We found like a little ancient cyberspace and we're going to, we're going to make it grow. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's so fascinating like that because that I I as you probably know I think about these things a lot uh, the the that's that's particular uh, philosophical aspect that we rally around it and we organize ourselves around it so it's changing us more than we change it and at the end of the day that is because it is us it is nothing but us it's like every every aspect of Bitcoin is the people in it. And, uh, we just find, a, found a way to trust one another without having to trust one another. And that's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like the reflection of just the, the volatility, humanity, whatnot. Yeah. Like, cause we, we know I was going to get into a discussion 
with like, the guys on Cafe Bitcoin where we talk about like, price, like just prices in general, it's just like, is it better to have accurate prices or stable prices? What are the trade-offs? Yeah. Oh, this, it's basically like saying that, that a high, having a high price in a market that just reflects accurate prices. It's ar- that's arguing about how the measuring device in the first place, rather than yeah. they've been showing, yeah, they're, they're saying that like having the ability to see accurate prices is bad because then you see that the prices can go way out of whack and then that scares people, but it's, but the other choice is like, would you usually put a sticker on the meter and don't actually yeah, yeah. see the, no. the flashing red. And so, but that goes, but uh, uh, harkens back to the uh, Ayn Rand saying that like, you can choose to deny reality, but you can't choose, you can't deny the, the consequences of, of choosing to deny reality. That's, that's what it is. It's like all the, the dashboard is just abstracted so far away that people don't actually see when the meters start to get flash red. I'm just having a thought around the trust. Like, is it, you know, if I tell you something, I might be lying. But if I pay you something in Bitcoin, I can't be lying. Or, or, or you know that l- trying to lie while I pay you in Bitcoin is more expensive than just paying you in Bitcoin. So that's the beauty. That's what makes the, I, I'm talk, if I'm talking, I might be lying. If I'm paying, I can't be lying. And that's, that will, yeah. what, what do you call that? It is a literal truth machine in that sense. Yeah. It's yeah. a unique form of communication I haven't encountered yeah. thus far. So it's, yeah. it's going yeah. to take a minute for us to adapt to it. Yeah. It's and, going to seem and, weird um, at first. Uh, a, a transaction between two people is is just communication. It's nothing but communication. It's just talking to one another and making promises that I, I promised that you that I did this much work and was able to make this much profit. Therefore, I can express value in this way to you. I like it's all just at the end of the day, it's all just, you know, promises uh, that that what I what I say is legit uh, and paying someone in Bitcoin is just that it's, it's showing the other person that I'm being absolutely truthful. Uh, that's what it is. And that you can count on me even, even when I talk and when I say other things to you, you can probably count on me because I have interacted with you uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, so that makes me more trustworthy than a person, uh, fiddling around with banks. Yeah, it's beautiful that it, it. The, is there, there's a direct link to humanity's ability to harness natural forces. Just that's all our ability yeah. to generate electricity is. Whether it's oh. nuclear, solar, wind, it's just, that's just us harnessing natural forces. Now we can condense that into a unit of money that we can then exchange value for. And it's, but yeah, the most truthful thing that humanity's ever encountered. It's, it's fucking weird. It, it is. Yeah. Um, I think those words are, are great final words for this show. Don't you think, Luke? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, absolute truth is fucking weird. The show is also sponsored by bitcoinbook.shop, the Bitcoin only bookstore by Consensus Network. Consensus specializes in translations of Bitcoin books and also publishes original titles in English and many other languages. Check out bitcoinbook.shop for all your Bitcoin book needs. Consensus is always looking for new contributors, whether you have a book you want to publish, you want to help translate books into your native language, or you have some other way you want to get involved. So if you want to help spread the Bitcoin message, reach out to Consensus Network by Twitter or email. Details are in the show notes. Yeah, and I think this has been a really nice, a really nice conversation, though, Ryan. Uh, I'm glad you uh, uh, you reached out and that uh, we could have you on to talk about this uh, because it, it really is a a great niche and so perfect for 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 bitcoin and uh, people concerned about the the efforts of uh forces that shall not be explicitly named to to depowerize the the world and this is just such a good solution because i mean uh, as as uh, michael saylor has said bitcoin only fixes half the problem right and i think we still need electricity and yeah. power and all this. And that's another part of the, maybe, maybe it's not the full other half, but it's, it's pretty close. So yeah, thanks for coming on and uh, 
telling us about what you're doing in the space. And it uh, really sounds like you're, you're doing some great things and making great connections. So looking forward to, to seeing and following what you're doing. And on yeah. that, can you tell our listeners where to find you and follow what you're yeah, up but one, I, If I may add one thing, Luke, it's, uh, this is a vastly unexplored sub-cavern of the rabbit hole. That's what it is. And uh, uh, happy to see what happens when you try to explore it more and when you flash a big light into it and see what you find there. I think we're just getting started. But yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I've heard uh, it, Clear Power has definitely come up a few times on this podcast, so I thought I would... Uh, poke my nose into the fray and see what you guys thought about it and explored it a little bit deeper. So that was a very fun conversation. Look forward to possibly seeing you out in the media real world someday at some conference or some, some Bitcoin Citadel. Um, yeah, on Twitter, I go by or Bitcoiner. Uh, and then I'm also on Noster and Orange Bill Apple. Those are pretty much most likely things that I will respond to a message on if you uh, track me down. But if you're interested in talking about nuclear power, Bitcoin, or if you want to like I know some of the people in the, their space that uh, some of these companies are still in their early investment rounds. So if you have capital that you would like to di- direct towards this industry, I can help you know, that out, stuff like that too. But, uh, yeah, it's great talking to Guinness on there. I look forward to see where this very subcat, very niche subcategory goes in the future. So I think we're just getting, just getting started. This talent energy thing is just the beginning. Fantastic. Beautiful. Thank you, Ryan. To you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks, gentlemen. So what did you think of the episode? Ryan's perspective on the importance of nuclear energy was enlightening and definitely gives me hope for the future with Bitcoin and nuclear working together. Let us know what you thought about the episode. You can send us a boostergram on Fountain, leave us a comment on YouTube, or get in touch on Nostra or Twitter. Don't forget to give us a follow to stay in touch. You can support us on Geyser Fund, Patreon, or send sats directly to freedom at getalpi.com. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like the episode and subscribe to the channel. Even if you're just listening, head over to our YouTube channel and subscribe. It would be a big help. Our show sponsors are Wasabi Wallet, Orange Pill App, and BitcoinBook.shop. That's all for now. See you next time, and thanks for listening.